Um, good, uh, good evening. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? It's so awesome. great to chat awesome. with you. Awesome. And Marcus, how are you doing? Doing well. Excited to be here today and so happy to be having this conversation and that you've gravitated to our film and, and have given us such great feedback on it already. Big time. Yeah. So um, I think, uh, Marcus, I think this is the first time we've spoken um, just kind of um, other than coordinating the meeting and things like that. So it's very nice meeting you um, and getting insights um, as to the people who are on the team, because I have a lot of questions, you know, as far as the, how you guys all came together and do this uh, and, and, and made this project happen. Um, but, um, Mikhail, when we spoke last, we were, you, were, um, you were getting ready for the premiere. Right. Yeah. Um, how did that go? So the premiere went really, really well. We had the premiere in New York City at Clamp Art Gallery in Chelsea, and it went up on September 17th, Friday, and it's running until October 30th there. And okay. over a over hundred people came. And nice. also afterwards, so the film was running on loop in about 30, it was about 30 minutes long, it was running on loop. So it ran about six times over the course of the three hour period. And we actually had a standing ovation also for the work. So that was really exciting. Um, to see the reaction there. Yeah. I thought, G, let me give you all G for that one. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Listen, I watched it with my wife. Um, we were about to go to bed. It was late. And I said, um, you know, that I, there's um, a creator, a filmmaker that I was speaking to, and he um, had shown me his projects. Now, prior to me watching that, I had seen images, um, and I, either from the Cosmologies Connect collection or they're, I mean, of course, they're linked, you know, just I had seen images kind of floating around and that type of thing, but I didn't know that there was so much more under the iceberg as far as that went. So that when you brought it to me, we were glued. We didn't, <laughs> we barely spoke to each other. We were just like watching this thing every now and then we would try because we're both familiar with the story in reference, right? So every now and then we would be like, okay, that's that, you know, that kind of thing. But for the most part, we didn't need to say anything, even though the film itself, you know, wasn't vocal. It was, it, it was, uh, it was very engaging. So that was awesome. So what we we're talking about is Obim, uh, or the Primordial House, a film by Mikel Wunna and uh, Marquise Red. Um, so I wanted to ask you to kind of describe um, what is Obim. Okay, I could jump in. So yeah, Obi Umbu is a 30-minute choreographed dance film that tells an evil myth of creation, um, specifically the Odachi in a Ebere cosmogony that's recounted in Enze Nwafor's Lepers of the Magical Dawn. So the film features two dancers from Pittsburgh Ballet Theater. We have Corey Bobronier playing Achuku and Victoria Watford as Ekin Achuku. And we see them illuminated under this backdrop of ultraviolet light as they reenact this myth in a sequence of four acts. And as far as um, Obimbu goes, what made you guys say this is the project? Like, walk me through the story of how the inspiration came and then how the inspiration got materialized into what it did. Yeah, it's really interesting. So I've been working on the series Infinite Essence, which is kind of similar in terms of the visual style. And that was originally inspired by the work of Chino Achebe and his own reflections on the chi. And he talked about in one of his essays, he discussed is the chi um, an infinitesimal manifestation of Chuku's infinite essence. And so I began working over the last few years in terms of trying to visualize the chi in a lot of the images with these starry formations using a combination of ultraviolet photography and um, again, fluorescent paints. And at the beginning of, at the beginning of um, last year, Marcus and I were in conversation. We were in a book club together and I received a grant from the Pittsburgh Foundation and the Heinz Endowments. And originally the thought was, okay, we could do a live performance that would then bring the photography to life. And then of course with COVID, live performances weren't gonna happen. So Marcus and I were, we were reading and Marcus can talk a bit more about the book club he started specifically for black gay men, but thinking about African spirituality and we were reading Law Force text and came across the myth and the story and it really captured us and then really catalyzed and became a part of this red walk that then became the film. Okay, and I was gonna ask where, as far as the team went, um, where the, like, was it that one person read it and said, hey, let me show uh, uh, 
member B or a team member B that, you know, what I've read or was it a collective thing? But Marcus, um, you said that he had mentioned that, that you have a book club. Yeah, so we wanted to basically have a space um, for Black gay men specifically to have a um, venue to engage with works of African cosmology and spirituality from a lot of different contexts. And we went through texts from not just the Igbo perspective, but from ancient Egyptian and Dogen and Dagara uh, cultural context as well. Um, but this particular myth that we came across was very special to us for a lot of reasons. I mean, so one, in Mikhail's earlier photographic work, you can see that he worked a lot with dancers. And so there are these very strong poses, these very acrobatic um, movements, and this, this sense of energy that comes through the images. Um, and we wanted to capture some of that feeling in a, in a different kind of medium. And so when we came across this particular myth, um, it's focus is on a dancing God and about a God who is creating the world through dance. I mean, so basically he's in this primordial house with his feminine counterpart. He's dancing in and out of this secret chamber. Um, she knows that he's doing some kind of secret work in there, but doesn't know what it is. Her curiosity is inspired. She goes into the chamber, which sets off a whole chain of unfortunate events. Um, so, I mean, so we have this myth of a dancing God, we have Mikhail's work with dancers, and then there's this whole Igbo idea about the whole world being in motion, particularly when thinking about the Ejeli masquerade, where everything is moving from the smallest atom to the largest galaxies. So I think we wanted to find a, a artistic space to just bring all of those ideas together and, and see what happens. Yeah, you know, based on what I do, you know, I'm a, uh, I consider myself a student teacher. So I research and I teach at the same time, um, but I'm always learning and that type of thing. And based on my own, you know, background and what I knew, things like that, there was a level of detail in the symbolism, in the movements, in the choice of, the choice of dance, period. You know, so I guess the next question I'm going to ask you guys is going to be very loaded. So I hope maybe you guys can divide it and share that type of thing. But as far as the creative direction, now you guys gave me a little insight on it um, as far as that went. But as far as the creative direction, what did the collaborative process look like there? Um, where as far as putting the symbols together, um, your I know your um your choreographer, your uh, motion coordinator is a genius, first and foremost, um, which remember, I, I, I want to say your name was Shante. I could be wrong. No? Uh, Ursula. Oh, Ursula. Ursula. Ursula, my Ursula apologies. Yes. Yes. So yeah, so uh, she, she did a very good job. So I wanted to ask you what that collaborative effort looked like because it, there, I felt, you know, usually this is kind of like a looking at it afterwards type of thing. There was so much unity of purpose and everything going mm -hmm. on. Um, that 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 was an interesting to me, so an interesting aspect to me. So I wanted to ask, and whoever wants to take it. Yeah, so I think I think we can both definitely jump in on this one. I think there was a few elements to it. So for me, so my I actually descend from a lineage of DBS on my mother's side, going to um, Abagana, and so even in terms of the actual work on the film, it was also really incorporated with ritual practice. So I did daily meditations where I was invoking my, my DB lineage, invoking my DB ancestors. And I did that also within the actual space where we did rehearsals, where we did the filming, and then even within the editing process, also calling them into the space, calling them to also ritually possess my body to use me as a vessel for creating the work. And so I think that was a really important aspect of it. And also visualizing them at the end of the process, giving us a standing ovation for the work. And so, they were with us from the very beginning until the end. And then Marcus also led some visualizations, which you can talk about, and also how we were reading the text, too. Yeah, so I'll jump in. I mean, so I think after we decided that this was a myth we wanted to work with, uh, Mikel and I basically went into overdrive to figure out how to assemble a team. And so we put together an application process for choreographers and that's how we found Ursula Payne, who's the chair of the dance department at Slippery Rock University, which is right outside of, of Pittsburgh. And we were just really impressed by how she described 
um, her dance practice and how she wanted to use specific dance signatures to bring evil cosmology to life. And, and she had had a lot of experience working with um, other dance traditions in the diaspora, particularly doing a lot of work in Brazil and Cuba. And so we got her on board first, then we got the other dancers um, from Pittsburgh Ballet Theater. And then we really just kind of organically grew from there. And like Mikhail was saying, I mean, it really was a combined artistic and spiritual process. I mean, so there was a lot of ritual work that accompanied the aesthetic decisions that we were making. And we really tried to make both processes aligned. I mean, so like he was saying with the visualization exercises, I mean, there would be moments where we would sit in the space that we were filming in, we would be in complete darkness. We would have some drumming music um, in the background to just try to get everybody into trance. And I would lead these visualization exercises where we would kind of go in our imaginations into this mystical cave to actually meet uh, the figures of Chuku and Ekene Chuku and really commune with them and try to ask how they would want to be represented in dance to try to see from their appearance what kind of movements we could mirror in the, in the physical world. And I think that kind of ritual artistic process yielded all kinds of all kinds of fruit. I mean, on one hand, I think it increased the emotional intensity of the film. And even after the filming was over, I think the repercussions still continue to resonate. I mean, so Tori, the dancer who portrayed Eke Nichuku, I mean, told us recently that um, even in her dreams and in visions, Eke Nichuku has still been appearing to her and giving her information about her health or about certain things she should do in her life or new directions she should go in. I mean, so it's been a real life-changing process, I think, for all of us. And um, I think the film is just part of our larger project of how do we recover and modernize and extend um, our traditional African knowledge systems and make them really even more relevant and useful in our, in our 21st century context. Yeah, you know, I had um, a discussion uh, very recently uh, with a couple of my patrons and things like that. And we were discussing about how our ancestors learn, like the process of learning and educating and things like that. Um, and I introduced the concept of ego mo, right? Um, so you guys are probably already familiar. I mean, you know, based on the fact that you literally, you did it, you know, <laughs> but ego mo is the process of um, releasing the self and allowing the spirit to occupy the self so that or it can you can interface with it right so this can be a sp the spirit of multiple things there's a very store uh, uh there's a semi-famous story i say semi-famous because a, a lot of people know the massacre or the dance but they don't know the um the origin uh but there was a gentleman for example who did he go more with a tree and the tree taught him uh, it's dance and from there, that type of thing. And I mean, it goes on and on. Most masquerades, the exact same thing. So whether it was deliberate or whether it was something out of an inspiration beyond the self, what you guys performed was Igor Moore. And what was very interesting about that is said that oftentimes when um, uh, when women perform Igor Moore, that, that same, that process, um, it, it stays with them in dreams and things like that. And that's how a lot of women become uh, healers and diviners. So it, what you just said really is something else, you know, that's really interesting. Um, but that's me going on a little tangent because as, as you're <laughs> speaking, I'm, I'm connecting these little things and I'm just like, wow, this is, this is something else, you know? Um, I wanted to ask, you know, committing to a work where you not only are approaching from a technical standpoint, at the level that you're approaching it, but as a, as a spiritual experience, right, uh, is is a is a is a major thing for for anybody involved. I wanted to ask, who did you make um, Obimbu for? Mm. Yeah. So I think first and foremost, there was the aspect of my lineage, my maternal lineage, and my the line of Dibias and. I remember when I was 12 years old, my grandfather telling, talking to me and discussing our lineage of healers from the village. And that really stuck with me. And so I think when I was creating the work, I was thinking about how in the 21st century, I'm standing in the shoes of my, of my ancestors and I'm working to modernize and advance our knowledge system in the 21st century. I think particularly with all of the chaos that's reigning now, 
and Noafer also discusses in his book the importance of people from DBL lineages in particular using our ancestral knowledge to um, address many of the really pertinent and pressing issues that we face in the modern age. And so the film is really a call to, I think, to my, to my ancestral lineage and also a way to kind of address it and to speak to a lot of these issues that we speak, that we're, that we're engaging with in this age that we're currently in. Yeah, and I'll follow on that too. Um, you know, according to Odinani, the, there are four world ages and the contemporary one that we live in, the fourth one is called Ugazi, that, which means the age of suffering. And Derek, I know you've done a brilliant series of videos on, on this concept and, and the four ages. Um, so, but when I think about who we made Obi Umbu for, I think about it being a film for the entire age, for the entire Ugazi, the age of suffering. Um, really, we could think of it as a, as a call for the restoration of the primordial house. I mean, it's, it's a ritual invocation of sorts that tries to summon this return to Ugaka, you know, the first primordial age, this time of oneness and spiritual unity. I mean, so it's really a mechanism to try to push us into the next phase of the cycle, out of this age of suffering, into this more enlightened spiritual age. I mean, so I would say broadly, I mean, we're hoping that this work inspires contemporary Black audiences to really reconnect with our African knowledge systems and, and these spiritual traditions that have been suppressed for so many centuries and really try to use them systematically as a guide towards, towards spiritual transcendence. That's powerful. Um, and it's interesting too, because um, even, you know, I, I present my, you know, my teachings and the things that I learn and want to share um, in, a, in a pretty academic format, that kind of thing, you know, it's just, it's, it's to be learned and that type of thing. Um, but I always say that when these ideas are put into art is when they really sink into the bone, you understand, when they really go all the way in and they, when they're really taken in. Um, and which is why I'm kind of doing this, uh, this interview series as well, you know, just looking at different people who are applying these concepts into their arts and in creative capacities and so forth. Um, so that is extremely powerful. Um, but I'm going to get back to Obi and Boone. I kind of want to talk about the, I, I, I'd seen um, something about the Cosmologies collection, um, and I kind of want to know a little bit more about that. But one thing I think is important to understand is who you guys are as individuals, mm. right? So I'm going to start with uh, Marquise. Um, how did you know that this is your path? Because you seem very grounded in your mission. Um, so how did you reach this point? Uh, how did I reach this point? Um, that's a good question. So, I mean, I would say, you know, I consider myself to be a traditional African cosmologist, a independent scholar, and a multimedia artist. So, you know, I've been immersed in a wide variety of African systems. I mean, I've been initiated in Afro-Cuban Centuria and different Kemetic or ancient Egyptian traditions. And I, I really have been grounded in trying to understand the symbols and the rituals in those spaces. Um, but as a scholar, I've been also drawn to try to understand intellectually the scope and power of these systems as well. I mean, so my background, um, did a BA in African and Afro-American studies at Harvard, then did a PhD in literature at University of California, Berkeley, um, became a professor for a while. I'm currently working on a book called Ancient Origins, Future Destinies, Blackness, World Creativity and the Word, where I'm trying to draw a historical continuum between ancient Egypt, West Africa, and Black America. Um, and so thinking about art and how I come to film, I, mean, I guess I would say, I think, just like you said earlier, that these are great venues for presenting these ideas and, and these engagements in a much more accessible venue and a more, much more accessible language. Um, you know, I'm from Macon, Georgia. I grew up, my parents um, ran an art gallery that specialized in African-American art. So I think even at a young age, I was always surrounded by different kinds of artistic practices and connecting with Mikkel, I think really has just given me a ground for that, for those seeds that were planted early in my life to really just bloom and flourish. So I, I've been really happy with this, this time and really being able to catalyze and push out work. Nice. Um, kind of following up on the book, because the, the, the topic is very interesting. Now, 
you are you have walked into the proverbial house, the comedic house. You've studied there. You've uh, engaged in Santeria, which of course has a mixture of West African as well as uh, 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 practices that are indigenous to its area and then to its history and so forth. So I wanted to ask now, you see a continuum. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Or I mean, maybe, maybe it's a spoiler alert thing or you should wait for the book or what? Well, yeah, well, I think they all, all of the African, traditional African systems I mean, are, are interconnected in very interesting ways. I mean, it's, when you think about it, I mean, it's really a matrix of a series of vibrant interconnected traditions um, that are tapping into very similar kinds of symbols and rituals. Um, but broadly speaking, I mean, I think we can define all of these traditions as sacred sciences. Yes. Um, basically um, knowledge that's not about a one dimensional rational approach to the world, but it's really about engaging with the world multidimensionally in ways um, where the divinization of consciousness is catalyzed. I mean, so all of these systems are really geared around transforming humans into divine beings. And I think that's the kind of ground that I see. And really, I mean, to me, they're all just like different languages. I mean, so when you know Spanish and Italian, Portuguese is just a little bit easier to learn. So even coming into this project, um, not only did I have the, the grounding in, in Egypt and Santeria, but I'd already been studying Ifa, um, Dogen, Dagoro, Yoruba cultures. I mean, so coming to, to the Evo project here, I mean, there was a real sense of familiarity um, mm -hmm. in the system. I felt like I just could grasp it or grasp certain things and elements of it very intuitively. And there was a way in which um, a lot of the presentations just really made sense. I mean, of course, with its own unique kinds of aesthetic approaches and, and scientific understandings of the world, um, but, but one that I really could see in a continuum with the others. That's really fascinating. Um, Nikhil, um, I wanted to ask you your story. Now, you had shared a little bit. Um, you come from a lineage of Debias on your mother's side, which means you know, gong, 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 as they say back home, you're a Divya, you know? <laughs> but um, I wanted to ask you, um, I wanted to ask you your story. Um, how did you arrive at this point um, at where you're at today? Yeah, it's been, it's been more of a circuitous journey, I would say. So I was born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and also growing up as like a queer evil person, that's really been, really shaped my experience. And so, when I, I think one of the parts of my biography that really was life-changing in many ways was when as a teenager, my father brought me back to Nigeria after finding out about my sexuality to put me through traditional exorcisms. And dealing with the trauma of that event, I actually was drawn to photography to find an artistic voice, an artistic outlet for myself. And so really ironically, kind of thinking back now, it's photography that then brought me back to studying traditional African spiritual science and knowledge systems and working to revive our ancestral understandings of the universe. And I think it's also really, um, it's been fascinating because my family has not been even supportive of the arts, really. They've been like, oh, you need to do something else. I guess I mean, I studied- well, I was getting there. Yeah, I was gonna get there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I studied engineering in college, and then um, even just like in the past few years, even as my art career started to kind of really blossom, they were trying to push me to become a doctor. And so I think when I knew that like, this, this was my path was when I actually applied to medical school, and I had an interview at the top medical school, you know, the, the dream, right, yeah, the dream for yeah. your person. Okay. And I almost broke down in tears because I knew it was not right for me. It was like every fiber of my being was like, no, don't do that. And so, whereas with art, you know, I can stay up until 3 a.m. working on projects, collaborating on pieces, and I feel energized, you know? You can, guys, I think even alive, yes. Exactly. And so I think that was when I really knew that this was my path and, my, my, and was meant to be what I'm supposed to be doing. Okay, now it's very interesting that you came full circle and you are presenting um, something that is, you know, not just cultural, but the root of the culture itself. 
especially after having such a traumatic experience with the culture, right? So how did you reconcile or balance that situation or how did you arrive at the, how did the relationship with the culture kind of reach where it's at? Yeah, one of the, I think one of the key mo- key parts for me was also a lot of research. That's why I also really vibe with you, Derek, because I feel like your research process really, yeah. <laughs> really does a lot for me. Cool. And so um, I worked on a documentary series about LGBT African immigrants for about six years after college. And in the pr- at project, I was also researching about pre-colonial African sexuality and gender. And there was a interview by Maladoma Somme, who is the Dagara spiritualist, who talks about how within traditional African societies, que- people who would not advise being queer were the gatekeepers to the spirit world. We are the diviners, we are the healers, we are the mystics, and we are the holders of spiritual knowledge. And so I think from that perspective, I started to think about th- like African, spe- African traditional understandings and African spirituality as a safe haven that has always existed for queer people. And so that really then became a space of me researching a lot more, jumping a lot more into the um, space. And then even conversations with Marcus about kind of the specific spaces for black gay men within African spiritual sciences, then really then brought me really full heartedly into exploring um, and going to the root of our cultural identity and heritage. And one of the pieces too that I find really interesting is that, you know, even as we have chuku and eke and chuku, they're both, they're, they're the two polarities of a primordial androgynous deity, right? Yes. And so yes. within that context, within um, Odinani, queerness, if we think about it from that kind of context, and androgyny has always been at the center of our traditions, never external. So I think the research is what really um, evoked and vibrated within me to then bring me back into um, really this being the core of my spiritual practice, my ritual practice, and my artistic practice in terms of reviving our um, African knowledge systems and our original understandings. Yeah, no, now listen, my memory is not the best. You're gonna learn that pretty quickly if you haven't already. <laughs> but um, there is a document, um, there's a collection of documents that I have in uh, the library that pay, like for the patrons on patreon.com slash the medicine show. Um, but it goes into this subject. And one thing that you learn very quickly as far as Igbo uh, cosmology goes is that Agon, I, I always do this as a symbol, Agon is a two-headed, um, is a two-headed uh, force or spirit, Amara, or whatever you want to call it, you understand. And Agon is the one that is linked to healing. I'm probably repeating things you guys already know, but Agon is the one uh, linked to healing, but Agon is also linked to things like wisdom and creativity and inspiration and so forth, right? Now, Agon is two genders. And there's no ritual where this is not emphasized. Agon, there's an agon that looks within, which is um, female, and the agon that looks out, which is male. And it is said that people, um, that people who are connected by, like intuitively, usually are closer to the middle than being on one side of the pole and one side of the other, because it's a reflection of that, that polarity, right? But of course, you're going to get... <laughs> A lot of people who are going to come with their own little opinions and things like that and so um that's why i always make sure to keep those documents where they're at because um that's something that needs to be emphasized um i i don't want uh this i don't want as people are walking into this new awareness um for people to start now lining up at the gates trying to shut people out based on their own feelings things like that so i really love what you guys are doing um full force um i wanted to ask another question, and this is just kind of um, for um, whomever wants to take it, or maybe I want to get both, or maybe we can get both your perspectives um, on it. Um, And this goes into, and this is just like a a curiosity thing, just from now being a fan of the film. Um, I saw a lot of figures in the images I saw before I even met you, right? Mm -hmm. But I didn't see in Obimbo, so is this a series or, um, or is, it, is it a one piece? Is it a series or is there something to that? Go ahead, Mikhail, you can take it. Okay, go for it. Yeah, so the, we're actually, so right now, um, so the cosmology series is a, is a photographic sequence of 10 images that are also on display at the gallery in New York. 
um, alongside the film. And so six of the images there play out the Igbo myth, the Odachi. And then there's four images that are dedicated to playing, playing out in Dogen myth of creation. Mm. And so many of the figures, like the two figures in the film, are a part of that series and they play a, a major role in both of them, Corey Bubini and Victoria Watford, who are also dancers with Pittsburgh Ballet Theater. Um, the other figures, currently we don't have a plan to, um, in terms of necessarily creating, producing another film with the other figures in the photographic series, but we are working on a few different ideas around live performance. We have an upcoming collaboration with the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra actually, um, where there's gonna be a 1200 square foot billboard that's actually dedicated to Igbo string wave um, cosmology. And Marcus is the model for that one, playing the role of the cosmic spider. And so we're also thinking about staging live performances. And there's also really just even within Leopards was that there was the Odachi is the fire elemental story, but there's also the air elemental story that he discusses in the text. I didn't see the water or the earth. I was, I don't know if I missed them in the text, but I'm like, wait, okay, so maybe there's other other pieces too. So yeah. the, the film also can bring itself into maybe a series of films, but definitely live performance is something that we're also really excited about exploring um, um, in the future. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we would really love to get even a new commission uh, to create a, a new large scale immersive live performance. I mean, I think Pittsburgh Ballet Theater would be a venue that makes sense since we've already worked with, with their dancers, but we're open to working with another company. I mean, but I do think the larger idea is, is a sound one. I mean, I think we do want to stage works like this in large venues as much as we can, um, because I think these are the kinds of work of works that really can provide a sense of spiritual, social, cultural, political empowerment. Um, so these are the kinds of images that we should invest in really as a community and, and try to proliferate as much as we can. Awesome, awesome. Um, and I wanted to ask, um, let me start with, um, let me start with, uh, well, whoever wants to take it can take it. Um, so there's a thing that happens with us as evil people, right, where, just if you make the wrong pivot, you're somehow an outsider in some situation. Um, for example, now, if I go to Nigeria, I'm American. You understand? They'll just, I'm an American. Mm -hmm. That's not who they see me as. You understand? If I come over here, I'm Nigerian, right? Um, if I'm among Igbo people, I'm, I'm from Imo State. That's like all these different things, right? Um, and then like um, Mikhail, for example, now you now have, you know, uh, the, you know queer, um, all these different things that are added on to it. Um, so let me ask uh, Marcus first. Uh, so yeah, let me ask Marcus first. Um, did you ever feel a sense that, you know, you're stepping into this culture where you're not technically born into, right? Did you ever feel a sense of, um, was there ever a sense of, um, was there ever a contemplation about the idea of belonging or maybe am I, do I have the space to, to work in this capacity and that type of thing? Oh, I have... Oh, that's an interesting question. I have a lot of, of, of various thoughts about that. I mean, I would say first and foremost, no, I never really felt like an outsider. I mean, again, as someone who has spent two decades at this point being immersed in African <laughs> traditions as both a scholar and a practitioner, I mean, I felt really, if anything, more of like a custodial energy of, of a need to preserve traditions that are quickly eroding as we speak for a whole host of reasons. So, I mean, I felt, you know, this is my mission and my duty to try to recover and capture and celebrate as many of these kinds of narratives as, as possible. And I mean, you know, like most African-Americans, I mean, I feel like I have roots in Nigeria. I mean, almost 50% of my DNA, according to, you know, the little test that they offer is from <laughs> Nigeria. I mean, and, you know, it's interesting because the majority of us working on this project are African-American, the choreographer, the dancers, myself. I mean, so, you know, I think we do have a claim to these cultural traditions and these spiritual systems. Um, and I think for us, I would say in general with African-Americans, I think collectively we're one of the most pan-African ethnic groups in the diaspora. I mean, we really try not to get bogged down by 
you know, tribalism and xenophobia that you might find in some other context. So I think for, for us as a community, I mean, so much of our energy over the last 400 years has been directed in an intense fight against white supremacy and trying to figure out how to divest from white spiritual systems and knowledge systems that I think we are kind of looking for any resource possible, whether here at home or abroad, in order to find ways to create new ways of being, to create world orders post white supremacy. So I think for, for me, I think about this film as being a part of that wider struggle. It's funny that you said your DNA came out in Nigeria. I could have told you that. But... Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I always, you know, I always say this jokingly all the time, but most of people taking those tests, I'm like, man, I can tell you the exact town you're from. You know, you absolutely. Know, it's, it's from features and things like that, you know, and, and you're exposed enough to the, not just the continent, but the diaspora to know, you know, kind of what I'm saying and stuff like that. So um, thanks you, for sharing but, that. But, you know, but let me, um, take take a stab at this question from another angle too right. i mean so this question about you know do you feel like an outsider coming into the story you know i would actually kind of reverse it and ask the opposite i mean so i would ask why this is the first time this story is being told in this format and i would ask why there's so many nigerians who might feel like they're outsiders to their own indigenous spiritual traditions. I mean, so I think about something like, like Nollywood, for instance. I mean, here we have an example of like one of the biggest film industries in the world, but to my knowledge, you know, there hasn't been, you know, a, a film or a series of films that tackles these creation stories, these kind of myths that are central to the culture. So, I mean, I guess my, my ask would be, why not? I mean, why, why are these traditions being abandoned or not being brought into contemporary media in, in the powerful ways that they should. Um, and I think, well, this is not just a Nigeria question. I mean, I think this is a question for the whole diaspora. I mean, like, what would it take for us to really um, become centered enough politically and culturally and spiritually to like really make these kinds of, of indigenous understandings of the world central to how we move? Yeah, you know, there's, um, there's a lot of history to that, of course, just like you'd find anywhere else um, in the wider African world. There's a lot of history to that. Um, but even as far as Nollywood goes, um, one, Nollywood's young, and then two, Nollywood was put together out of desperation, for lack of a better term, right? So Nollywood was put together, um, I mean, you might know the history, I'm just gonna be, try to be very brief more or less the Chinese were dumping a bunch of VCD players. Like they thought they were gonna make their own version of DVD and it didn't work out and DVD took over. So they just dumped them all in Nigeria, just like, go to the beach and there's a whole bunch of them there, that kind of thing. So a bunch of people, you know, poor people, people that didn't have too much would take the, them and try to sell them to other people. But in order to sell them, you need to have something to watch on them. So they started just putting together makeshift um, uh, movies. And one of the first uh, enthusiastic financiers were the churches, right? So a lot of the churches were the ones financing these movies and things like that. Then it later became like rich people who wanted to show off their house and that type of thing, <laughs> you know, all that stuff. And then so it kind of creates this skew where Nolly, we have a battle at home now where Nollywood um, for, especially in its early years was this evangelical tool. And according to Nollywood, everything African was evil, just as is the culture in the evangelical world. Everything African was evil. Once somebody, you know, the person that's going to be doing the evil thing is going to go to the Debia and they're going to do X, Y, Z to go kill that person and that type of thing. And, and the way you save yourself is you get a Bible and then the movie ends with glory be to God. You understand? Oh, so that's how you get the church money flowing and that type of thing. Um, but it is advanced to a stage now where I'm seeing something else. So there was a movie, um, I think it was Living in Bondage, I could be wrong on the title, but it, it was an old movie, it was very popular, it was about like, you know, ritualism and all these different things, you know, it was using that whole genre. But this time when it depicted it, it didn't depict it African, it depicted it Catholic, you understand? And they, they made a version in the 90s, they made a version in the 2000s. So I think that as people are becoming more, because all of us came to the point we're in because of information, right? we had the access to the information. So people are getting more access. I'm seeing some, uh, some positive things, but I agree with you 100%. 
we have this stockpile of stories as African people. I'm not just talking about Nigeria, I'm talking about everybody. Um, we have this stockpile of stories of African people that we haven't even began considering touching, right? And that's why when you guys did what you did, it was great. But I mean, like kind of more or less of what you said and implied, this definitely should have been done a lot earlier. You know, it's, it's a given, right? That type of thing. Um, so that's, that's interesting. So Mikel, I also wanted to ask you kind of the same question. Um, you know, we're both Americana, as they say, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, and oftentimes, you know, I, I, most of the feedback I get is positive, like 99.9. I always want to make sure to say that for anything, but every now and then you'll get somebody that's kind of like, you know, based on my accent and things like that, like, why are you saying these things? You know, how do you know, or that type of thing, or they'll try to test you and that type of thing. So, um, I know it's early, but I wanted to ask if you have had experiences with that, feeling that this is something that you're comfortable owning um, to the extent that you guys did, you know, now, go ahead. Yeah, so I think for me, that's been an ongoing piece with my work for years now. I mean, when, I think even as a teenager, I was told, I mean, of course being, Amer Americana, but then also like being <laughs> being gay, I also felt that I was un-African for being gay. And so I think right off the bat, I was kind of pushed into the space of people would people would discount what I have to say right away. And so I think it actually really was about the research, you know, and I think through the research process, really grounding it in specific texts. Um, Noir Force text, for example, um, text by Chinua Achebe, really learning and immersing myself in the, in the world. And it was really interesting because then I remember I would be even showing Insibidi that I'd be writing in some Insibidi and I'd be showing it to one of my uncles who's an Eze in, in, in Igbo land. And he'd, he'd be like, wow. He's like, he's like, he, he literally was like, you know more in these areas than yeah. I do. So I think, I think I started realizing because so many of our cultures have been so demonized, you know, that many people even back home don't know about the actual spiritual systems and foundations yeah. of our culture. Yeah. And so I think I also had to kind of come from it from that perspective of really trusting the research. And so even when family members, people, other people would come left and right, Many, unfortunately, because of how colonized we are and we have been, they don't even, like, even though they grew up in, quote unquote, the culture, yeah. they don't know the actual cosmological foundations of our understandings of the universe. Right. And so it's definitely been a motif, but I think specifically the research and then also leaning into my lineage, right? My lineage of Debias my lineage as a gatekeeper, and that also that space of that primordial androgyny, which is always kind of centered, you know, black queer people as being the gatekeepers and the mystics. And so centering myself in that space has been a really important part of trying to discount that as much as possible, because I mean, when you know what you've researched and what you've worked on, then you have, yeah, there's a level of confidence that it, that it comes with, that it brings with it too. Absolutely. You know, these are affairs of the spirit too. I don't, I don't think that somebody gets precedence because of X, Y, Z geographic factor. If somebody else's spirit resonates with it more elsewhere, you understand. Um, but I do think we do have an advantage here in the U S I always say that the best place to learn these things is outside of Africa, you know, um, because it's just recent that people have had enough, um, stability as far as technology goes to so even sit down and research you know and sit down and read things and as that's happening i'm noticing this big change happening. this big change that's happening and we're going to be seeing a lot more of it hopefully we're going to be seeing a lot more um from you guys as well um i i, I think um we're about time it's about time to wrap things up you know um and i kind of want to ask you guys for some final words um projects to look out for um and then of course uh where to find uh you guys's work um, for those who are interested. Um. Yeah, so I guess I'll start with where people can find the work and then you know we can talk about next steps as far as projects go. So the film has three confirmed venues so far. So it's currently showing in New York 
at Clamp Art Gallery, which is in Chelsea from now until October 30th. Um, then we're going off to LA um, and it'll be showing in Venice at the Iris Project Gallery from November 6th through the 30th. And we're having a big opening party on that Saturday, November 6th from three to five. And then we'll also go to North Carolina um, at the Contemporary Art Museum in Raleigh, November 14th, five through 8 p.m. So I would just encourage everybody to go to mikelawuna.com and you'll find information about all the screening dates and things like that. I mean, we're also working on an online premiere for 2022. We're trying to organize a more robust film tour. So of course we're open to ideas about additional venues and places we can screen the film. I mean, we will travel <laughs> wherever people will have us. Um, you know, there's also an exhibition catalog that is available for purchase that has screenshots of the film. And I know Derek, we can share some of those screenshots with you as well. Oh, for and sure. Yeah. Essays, yeah, essays about the film by me. Uh, Mikhail has an essay in there and our fellow artist, Jamu X. And you can email info at clamp, C-L-A-M-P-A-R-T dot com. And, and you could get the book from there. Definitely. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. So I'll be adding all that, you know, um, afterwards, of course. Uh, but definitely. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, you guys, you know, I and the, the next one I wanted to ask is when everybody gets to see it. But you, you had already shared that there's going to be a digital uh, premiere. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, I know this is going to inspire a lot of people. I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys produce in the future. Looking forward to seeing what the people inspired by you produce in the future. Um, everything I guys are doing very optimistic and wonderful. So I present you guys all G as a mark of respect. Mugato, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome.